There's a word from the Lord. Would you say amen? There is a word from the Lord. There's a word from the book. And I'd like to ask you, if you would, to journey with me. We're going to the book of Revelation. What book did I say? We're going to the book of Revelation. We're going to Revelation chapter 7. I'm giving you time to look for it so I can tell you what I'm going to tell you. And after I tell you what I'm going to tell you, I will tell you then what I have told you. So let me tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you that our subject is entitled Until. I'm going to tell you that that word speaks to us about the particular time when something would begin. It talks not only about the point of beginning or the duration of a thing, but, but it tells us in context its, it's, it's time limitation until. Uh, and if you are given into this English stuff, I have an English teacher sitting right here before me, I think. Uh, uh, sometimes there's a struggle between whether until and the word till, that's T-I-L-L, -L, if, if one is an abbreviation, no. As a matter of fact, the word T-I-L-L -L is a word by itself. It's not an abbreviation of until. And if you are uh, adept in English, you would know that the word till is older than until. But until is, is seen as the preferred word in both formal and informal context. So I, I know a song that says, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sound no more. Uh, uh, hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Uh, 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 so that word till and until uh, speaks of the duration maybe of a challenge. I, I can deal with some stuff if I know that it won't last forever. I'm just beginning to warm myself up. You see, I'm not bothered by you. I'm just warming myself up. I can handle some stuff if I know that there is a limitation to that stuff. I, I can cry for a while if I know that the tears won't last forever. I can handle it when David said weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come because the night will last only until the morning comes. I are you feeling where I'm going? So I'll talk to you about until. Then I'll talk with you about the fact that Revelation 7 is seen as what they call a prophecy of divine interposition. Uh, a prophecy of divine interposition. Why do they call it that way? You see, I'm talking about the seventh chapter. Uh, chapters 6 and 8 are directly connected. Uh, the Bible talks about the seven seals. Six of those seven seals are found in chapter 6. None is found in chapter 7. The seventh seal begins in the eighth chapter. But, but you see, the seventh chapter is, is interposed to, to provide an answer to, to two questions raised in chapter 6. Every now and then, God will pause to help us understand that, that the pain won't last forever. I'm just warming myself up. Are you listening to me? So, so that it is called a prophecy of divine interposition uh, and the, 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 the chapter in my opinion in my mind uh, in my look at the Bible is answering two questions and I'll I'll find them for you momentarily so I'll talk to you about until I'm just telling you what I'm going to tell you and after I'm through telling you what I'm going to tell you I will tell you what I told you the subject is until I told you that did I not I said the seventh chapter is where we're going. Did I not tell you that? I told you that the seventh chapter is a prophecy of divine interposition. Are you listening to me? I'll tell you also that the text reveals the sovereignty of the power of Elohim addressing universal cataclysmic catastrophe and final judgment. I will tell you also that the prophets in the chapter speaks to us about divine classification as he talks about the sealing and the separation. I'm just telling you what I'm going to tell you. Shall we pray? And then I'll tell you. Our Father in heaven, 
This is your word. These are your people. Not just in this place, but around the world. I'm only a wretched lump of sinful clay. Step from between these pages of your holy word. And make the message come alive for the glory of your name and the saving of our souls that are asking in Jesus' name. And together we say, Amen. So now, can we read together Revelation chapter 7? We will read 1, 2, and 3. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. And then I saw an angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, saying, do not harm the land or the sea until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. If you have the authorized King James Version, the wording may be slightly different. There are four times in the book of Revelation that you bump into the wording in its same order and the words are and after these things. Uh, maybe I would preach on that someday but, but here in the seventh chapter the text says after this, if you have the King James, it would read, and after these things. And therefore, by way of logical reasoning, in order to understand what is here being addressed, you have to ask yourself, what are these things? The immediate context of verses 1, 2, and 3 uh, finds its home in chapter 6. You see, uh, chapter 6, uh, I think, has 17 verses in the authorized version. It's interesting to note that the first four seals in the 6th chapter, the prophet uses only two verses per seal. So, of the 17 verses in the 6th chapter, the first eight verses deal with the first four seals. And the last two seals in the chapter, he uses nine verses to cover them. And while I'm at it, you'll discover that the seventh seal is not covered by nine verses, but by one, two, three, four chapters. So chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11 are used to deal with this awesome final seventh seal. There's something here in, 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 in the first six of these seals that form the basis of our first verse in the seventh chapter and after these things you see on the seal number four unleashed you find fierce persecution testing trials bloodshed famine and destruction, albeit limited in particular scope and context. And in that fifth seal, there is a cry for justice. There is the screaming out and, and the fifth seal paints the picture. Uh, and if you're not careful, you may be even running away with wrong interpretation. For on the seal number five, you find the description, the symbolic representation. He said, I saw the souls beneath the altar crying out, Oh Lord God, how long? How long? 
long before you avenge the blood of the righteous. The altar there represents sacrifice. It represents the ultimate price of loyalty. Don't you know that Paul in Hebrews chapter 11, 32 to 40, talks about those who were sacrificed, stoned. He said, of whom the world was not worthy. And he said something in the chapter. He said, they without us will not be made perfect. In other words, they along with us who will suffer for the gospel's sake will make it to the kingdom together. And somebody ought to say amen. And so, and so on the seal number five, Revelation 7 is answering the first question that is raised under the fifth seal. How long, how long has it ever seemed to you that God is sometimes either hard of hearing, unfeeling, or uncaring. Now, let me talk to myself. You're too righteous. You, you've never had a trial. You've never had a tear. You've never had a question for God. You, you've had it made every day. You've never had to wait for the answer to any of your prayers. So let me talk to me. Thank you. I have a weakness out there. Because I know me. And I know sometimes I, I ask God quietly. Like David. Why do the righteous have to suffer so long? David said, I almost lost my way. When I look at the wicked, he seemed to have unending prosperity. He seemed to have no trouble. He said, I almost lost my way being envious of the prosperity and the peace of the wicked. He said, but when I enter the sanctuary, when I enter the sanctuary, where your truth is declared, where your word is made evident, and know though the sinner should do evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, it shall be well only with the one who fears God. So under seal number five, the question, how long? And there is this symbolic representation of souls under the altar well can I help you with that in Hebrews 11 and verse 4 Paul said that Eve Abel being dead yet speaketh was it the dead Abel who was speaking let me help you let me help you let me help you in Genesis when God came to Cain to address the issue of murdering Abel, what did God say to Cain? God said to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood speaks to me, cries to me. So what we have here in this divine prophecy of divine interposition is God answering the two questions raised under the fifth seal and the sixth seal the first question under seal number five how long is the desire for the end of injustice a desire that there'll be no more george floyd a desire that there'll be no more social inequity a desire that no more madman would die for want of trial in our prison system a desire that there shall be no more suffering and injustice how long that's the question on the seal number five but the question on the seal number six comes up in the last verse of the sixth chapter Question under seal number five. Ask the question, how long? Question under seal number six. Ask the question, who shall be able to stand? For in the closing part of the sixth chapter, the great Elohim, the great El Shaddai, would 
demonstrate in prophetic terms that he's in charge that his judgment will be unleashed that iniquity and transgressions and ungodliness shall be dealt with in a just manner but the prophet the prophet raised the question in the context of all of these calamities you see John was sitting with Jesus. Matthew 24 and verse 3 said, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him. That's Matthew's version. But I love Mark. I love Mark. Mark 13 tells me he sat on Mount Olives in sight of the temple. And Peter, James, and John, and somebody else came to ask Jesus what shall be the sign of thy coming when shall be the destruction of Jerusalem hang with me hang with me I'm laying a foundation so they're in the temple and Jesus is now leaving the temple and they said master do you see the magnificent splendor of this temple do you see the awesome spectacle hear the preacher hear the preacher the temple is not the object of worship God is and sometimes we get so caught up with the temple with the building that we forget the living God the Jews Ellen White said would have stoned Jesus easier for speaking against the temple than for speaking against God and sometimes we get so tied to the building and our office in the church that mission and worship and service is made secondary so they asked Jesus he's leaving the temple he sees all the stuff and he said to them you see all of this not one stone will be left standing on another listen to the preacher it almost breaks my heart to see that God would choose the heathen to butter down the temple because the worshippers in the temple had forgotten and had abandoned the God of the temple. Can I make it plain? Can I make it plain? There's a danger that we can be cultural Adventists. We come to church on the Sabbath because we've been cultured that way. But as we step on in here and if somebody look at you with cross-eyed, you're not going to stop to see it's cross-eyed. You can say the person is looking at you the wrong way and without talking to the person, you go to somebody else. Child, him look at me a certain way and the reason him look at me that way is because of so-and-so. When all that happened is the brother has cross eyes. If God was in my heart, if worship was a center that captivates my being, whether he looks at me with a cross or yes or no I know why I go to church I know who I go to worship you can say what you want you can do what you want he's been too good to me every time I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me my heart cries out hallelujah and so I come to worship not the building not to see my friends but i come to worship the living god who says i shouldn't forsake the assembling of myself together so jesus said jesus said to them you see all of these things there shall not be left one stone and another and so in mark 13 and in matthew 24 he uses a lot of time and statements to tie together without setting 
chronological order the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming of Jesus he said I'm going to tell you these things so when you see them know that my words are true so, so then in the sixth chapter under the sixth seal the prophet sees cataclysmic destruction he sees earthquake and wars and strife the kings and the great men but there's something here that jolts his mind he remembered that Jesus talks about when he comes back the powerful will stand at the judgment bar the powerless will stand there and so here he is here he is and, and you can't miss this you can't miss this of all the disciples this one who is receiving the message the last one in the Bible is the only one of the twelve to die a natural death all the others are already dead all the others have been persecuted all the others but he's standing and he knows that he also could have been dead from persecution how do i know that they place him in a pot of boiling oil intended to kill him but when god has you in his hands ain't no power in hell that can take you out when hallelujah when god sets his hand upon you to bless you it doesn't matter who don't like you trust in the lord your god with all your heart and lean not to your understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path the text the text says the text says and after these things I saw standing at the four corners now you got to understand that the, the scientific understanding of the prophet and of ancient people was that the earth was flat God works with your understanding and he'll make his message clear utilizing your understanding I think if God, if Christ was here today, he wouldn't use sheep and goats in his parable. Are you listening to me? I think if he was writing today, he wouldn't talk about books writing up the judgment. He'll talk about computer chips. He'll say on your tablet, on the computer, the record was kept. But they never had computer then so he spoke to them in their own language so the prophet never had an understanding scientifically about our own world he said I, I saw four angels standing at the four corners but even us on our own world we talk about the four points of compass north south east and west are you listening to me he's saying whether it's four corners or north south east and west are wrong God is in charge the central point he makes here he said i saw four angels at the four points of compass north south east west holding back the winds of strife let me help you let me help you i hear your question i hear your question what does wind mean here prophecy a prophet is there a hurricane that's coming oh what does wind mean here you see the prophet was a reader of the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah he knew from from how God has already used the term he knew that wind in prophecy means fierce destruction it means storms it means contention so when he sees here he said I saw four angels holding back the winds of destruction well let me help you let me help you I love Ellen White she said, and I wrote this down, she, she said, in, in, in Great Controversy, page 614, 
as the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion all the elements of strife will be loose and then in page 335 I, I'm trying to find the next one that I love but, but let me save some time she said there is a divine hand holding the wheels there is a divine hand let me read it for you in the closing work we shall meet with perplexities that we know not how to deal with but let us not forget that the three great powers of heaven are working that a divine hand is on the wheel and that God will bring his promises to pass he will gather from the world a people who will serve him in righteousness counsel to the church page 356 there is a divine hand on the wheel left to himself the devil would have killed you in your sleep last night I said left to himself maybe you and I would have been dead a long time ago but God has a purpose some of us need to be given one more chance to wake up some of us oh hallelujah he has a mission for your life and that's why he's holding destruction at bay let me run with the passage the passage says I saw four angels holding back the winds of strife I told you that wind means war and contention four here means the points of compass north south east and west it means that God is in charge it means that no matter how rough things get it could have been worse if he wasn't in charge I don't know why God allowed Joseph to go to prison but he's in charge I don't know why God allowed uh, John the Baptist to have lost his head in Herod's dungeon but he's in charge I don't know why God allowed John the Revelator to be placed in a pot of boiling oil but he's in charge and the Bible tells me he will work out his purpose and all we've got to do is pray like David order my steps in your word oh God guide thou my feet in the paths of righteousness I have a, a long way to go and I won't pay any attention to the I saw four angels standing at the four corners holding back the winds of strife to prevent the wind from blowing on the land and the sea now I want to tell you something John said he saw five angels he saw four holding the points of compass there's something about John and the fifth angel when he saw him before he heard what he said he said he saw what he had before John tell you what he heard from the angels he's telling us what he saw in the angels hand let me read the text it's in the text it's in the text the text says then I saw another angel so, so how many were the others four north south east and west he said I saw those four and I saw what they were doing but let me tell you now I'm seeing another one I saw another angel coming from the east Old Testament prophets are accustomed to the east the rising of the sun to being God's favored position so John said that I'm seeing this other angel coming literally from the dwelling place of God he's coming from the east but before he tells us what he heard 
he tells us what he sees so he said he is having in his hand the seal of the living God and after he told us what he has in his hand he then tell us what the angel said so let me tell you he said I saw in his hand the seal of the living God then I heard him calling out to the four angels saying hurt not the earth don't hurt the trees don't let go yet hold back strife hold back destruction hold back contention hold back death until I seal the servant of the living God now this is where my topic comes from until until child of God can I encourage you you may have some battles to fight but it's only until you may have some tears to shed but it's only until you may never understand what God is doing in your life but it's only until because we shall understand it better by and by by and by when the mists are rolled away by and by when the skies shall roll asunder cry if you must but it's only until can I talk it now can I say what's come to my mind he once told me I gotta say it to you God established his concept of marriage in the Garden of Eden. But I want to say to a certain community, you may have your way, but it's only until you may trample God's ideal of marriage, but it's only until are you listening to me and no matter how long that until lasts for the two of you can produce a child I know we are infecting and injecting a young generation with the wrong concept of marriage and family but it's only until it's only until because the one who made man in his own likeness he tells us for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh let the world do what is want but it's only until it's only until we may confuse some people but it's only until you may be confused about your own gender but it's only until are you listening to me you may trample the word of God beneath your feet but it's only until 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 I told you the word says the word means there's a limit to the stuff it's only until I told you the meaning of the word it's only for a while so he said hurt not the earth nor the seas hold back the winds of strife until we seal the servants of our God in their forehead I need 45 minutes more can you help me out here listen to me carefully hear the preacher hear the preacher Genesis is the book of beginning Eden is the story where it begins and in the garden of Eden there were two holy institutions that the devil hates but he's trying to misrepresent the first one is marriage God ordained marriage between a man and a woman but the world said something else but it's only until I coming right there I coming down your street he made the world in six days he blessed and sanctified the seventh day Sabbath as a mark of his divine creatorship in the Garden of Eden the world may try to change it 
but it's only until arrow may prevail but it's only until they may trample God's commandments underfoot but it's only until are you listening to me but here the preacher the ancient prophet is accustomed to a certain usage of seals while I do not condone slavery but he's accustomed to Roman slavery and he knows that Roman government would seal their property would set a seal upon their property even upon their slaves and their horses and their chariots Roman seal would tell the stuff that belong to Rome well John says well I've got news for you God is sealing his own can I talk to you Paul gives us an understanding of the sealing stuff in 2nd Timothy 2 and verse 19 Paul says having this seal now hush your fuss he never said having a seal. He said having this seal. He uses the definite demonstrative attribute to point out a particular seal. Having this seal. The Lord knows his own. I love the Bible. The text says the foundation of God is sure. Are you listening to me? So you don't have to make any mistake as to who God's children are. Can I tell you something else? It is not their mere church membership that that is settled either. So he said, bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Part of the greatest religious controversy in our world has to do with God's Ten Commandments. And of the ten, almost every Christian church in town believe thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not tell lies. And you shall honor your mother and your father. And you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. And, and you shall have no other God apart from him. But the trouble, the trouble, the trouble with the ten is commandment number four. Commandment number four. And it bothers me that of the ten, the only one that begins with the word remember is the one the world has chosen to forget. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days shalt thou labor and do all your work but the seventh day now I hear you I hear you I hear you somebody said preacher don't you know we can't tell which day is the seventh day don't you know preacher we can't tell which day is the Sabbath day well I go to Matthew 28 verse 1 and the Bible tells me in Matthew 28 verse 1 in the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre hush your first two things number one when the first day comes, Sabbath was gone. Number two, according to the Bible, Sabbath and the first day are two different days. According to your Bible and my Bible, it says that Sabbath comes before the first day. Sabbath is the last day of the week. And the text says in the end of the Sabbath. Mark says when the Sabbath was passed, as it began to dawn toward the first day, they came by the sepulcher. Is the settlement of the argument the Word of God says the Sabbath is the one that God blessed and sanctified he blessed the seventh day it is no war between denomination it's a question of loyalty it's a question of allegiance but it's going to be only until I said it's going to be only until because Isaiah in divine inspiration said it shall come to pass in the earth made new that from one Sabbath to another all flesh 
shall come to worship before the Lord God. But here we are living in the period of the until. But let me come back to the text. The text says, Do not hurt the earth, the land, the sea, nor the trees, until we seal the serpents of our God in their foreheads. Until we seal the servants of our God in their forehead. I told you that the seventh chapter is answering two questions. The first question was, how long? And the answer is, not long. Well, how do I know that? When will the final sealing be over? Well, don't you know that Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of obedience to the will of God, the gospel of repentance from sin, the gospel of obedience to Jesus, the gospel of strength in Jesus Christ. This gospel shall be preached to all the world as a witness and then, 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 when the whole world will have gotten the warning, Bless the Lord God when COVID-19 got started. I didn't know I could stay right here and preach to 78,000. Listen to me carefully. Then this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness. And then the end shall come. Because God has a vested interest in the protection of the justice of his character. Are you listening to me? Before you drop dead, he'll give you a chance to understand right from wrong. He'll give you a chance to know there is a savior. He'll give you a chance to know, thus sat the Lord God. Hurt not the earth until Hurt not the earth until. Well, there's something that's bothering me. All our strife are not external. Walk with the preacher. You may have formed the opinion that the only strife, the only contention, the only conflict that can kill our external strife an external conflict well they told me that internal bleeding is more dangerous than external bleeding and some of us sometimes we have some internal battles we have some internal conflict we have some internal struggle sometimes food has no taste to our mouth sometimes we are lonely in the midst of a crowd sometimes we are hemorrhaging on the inside a stop but I tell you, he's got power to hold external strife, but he also has power to hold internal strife. When the raging winds of internal conflict seem to threaten your very sanity, when you put your head on the pillow, and liquid frustration wet your sheet and wet your pillow. You have food in your house. You have a car in the porch. You have a flat TV in every room. You have carpet wall to wall, but you still have untelevised colored catastrophe. You still have wall to wall confusion. You still have a war raging on the inside and you drink, but you're not full. You eat, but you're still hungry. As a matter of fact, the food has no taste to your mouth because of what's happening on the inside. Hold the winds. I thank God he is touched with the feelings of your infirmities hold the winds I thank God that when nobody else understands he does 
He does. He does. Hold the winds. Hold back the strife. I've talked to folk to whom doctors have given sleeping pills and it can't help them. I've talked to folk on medication intended to sedate them. I was at a certain workplace on Thursday and a man said something to me. I don't know if he knew the impact that he had on me as I looked at him. You look at some folk and you see them simple. He said, Pastor, I lay on my bed in the hospital and the doctor said to me, all the medication I'm giving you for your blood pressure that's getting out of hand will not work until you clear your mind. All the medication I'm giving you will not work until you clear your mind. I'm talking to somebody in Africa. I'm talking to somebody in Australia. I'm talking to somebody in Barbados. I'm talking to somebody in Bombay, India. I'm talking to somebody in Canada. I'm talking to somebody in Calcutta. I'm talking to somebody in Denmark and Ethiopia and Egypt and Finland. There is a God who can help you clear your mind. You don't have to lose your mind. There's a God who can help you clear your mind. Truth is, there's a song I grew to love. I'm all churched out. Sunday Patty have a song that says, broken on the back row of the church. Listen to me. The text, the text has so much in it. The text says, hold the winds of strife until we settle God's children. Can I tell you, he's talking about a future calamity. He never said some won't die. He never said some won't have hard times. What he said, I'm going to seal them. So even if they die, they're going to die in Jesus. I'm going to seal them. I am going to secure them. Well, why must he allow us to go through strife? The truth is, some of us need some wind to shake us up in order that he may wake us up. Some of us need some strife. We are too contented, too settled, too sedate. He's got to shake us up, wake us up. And if we fail to wake up, he'll then sift us out. Listen to me carefully. He is shaking us. He is sifting us. And he is sealing us. He is shaking us. He is shaking us. He wants to wake us up. And if we fail to wake up, he go sift us out. But there's one thing that's clear. He's going to seal his own. I'm going to say something now that's going to disturb some people. But you see, I heard a song from Bob Marley says, I want to disturb my... I didn't say that. Listen to me carefully. The Roman seal that John knows has three distinct features. It has a name of the king. It has his authority. It has his domain. I said the seal that John knows. When it 
talks about the seal. There are three things he looks for. It has got to say who the king is. It has got to say the extent of his authority, his office, his position, and his domain. Well, Jesus to the prophet says, bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Well, God, which of your commandments could equate to a seal? Which would qualify? Which of the commandments can tell me who you are? Your title and your domain. He said, preacher, don't you know? It's the same one that the devil hates. The devil wants to be God. The devil wants my place. Commandment number four tells us who the true God is. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That's his name. What's his title? In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth his title, his creator. What's his domain? The heavens and the earth. That's the seal that John could identify with. So the prophet, harden of the earth, hold back destruction, hold back calamity, hold back the winds of strife. The gospel is being declared. There are persons in the room bar right now, in the prostitute den. There are liars and murderers and rapists and thieves. When they hear the gospel, they'll respond. They'll obey. And I'll seal them. I'll set my mark on them. Oh, bless the Lord. There, there's something else. Can, can I juice the text some more? Can I squeeze the text some more? Can I juice the text some more? The text says, we're going to seal the servants of our God in their foreheads. I've always been a dunce student. But even dunce me can tell you that the frontal lobe of the brain is where thoughts are processed and decisions are made. Isn't it interesting then that the prophet says we're going to seal the servants of God in their where? For it. That's where the choice is made. That's where the decisions are made. And somebody watching me right now have a choice to make. A decision to make. For somebody, it may be the decision to come back from a backsliding state. For somebody like the prodigal son, a decision to get up from the pig's pen and come back to your father's house. There are three lost types in the parable. The lost boy, he knew he was lost. He knew how to find his way back. He just needed to make up his mind. Are you that one? You know you're lost. You know you've wandered from the fold. You may be sitting in your living room in New York City or New Jersey or Connecticut or Washington DC or Australia or Ghana or wherever. You know where you belong. We called it the story of the prodigal son it's really the story of a loving father. He's waiting on you to come back. He's holding back destruction. You could have been dead. And maybe you're saying to yourself, you should have been dead. But mercy kept you. 
so you wouldn't let go. He's holding back destruction. He's shaking you up. Waking you up. Because he does not want to sift you out. He wants to seal you. For his kingdom. The lost sheep knew it was lost. But it couldn't find its way back. There are some folk right now. You know something is wrong. Thank God for the word. The word tells you what's wrong. The word tells you how to find your way back. And right where you are, God's word is coming to you. Maybe you never thought you had to obey God's Ten Commandments. Maybe you never thought the seventh day Sabbath was important. Maybe you never thought that you needed to live right. There's a phrase that you have come accustomed to by now. I'm going to say it anyhow. Black lives matter. All lives matter. But what I want to say to you is this. God's word matters. Obedience to God's commandments matters. The seventh day Sabbath matters. Loyalty to Jesus Christ matters. The grace of God matters. Hurt not the earth until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. I'm almost done. He's addressing the issues of righteousness and social injustice. He's addressing the issue. The ceiling will not come by way of material position or possession. The ceiling will not come by church membership only. It comes by obedience to the plain thus said the Lord God. Acceptance of the grace of Jesus Christ and a full surrender. For he has a standard and his grace is sufficient to lift us up to his standard. The issue of divine classification is the last thing I'll deal with in our text. The issue of divine classification. In the judgment of Matthew 25, Jesus talks about sheep and goats. Divine classification. Divine separation. He said he'll separate the sheep from the goat. In the issue of this prophecy of divine interposition, the separation is clear. The seal of the living God and the mark of apostasy. The seal of God is placed on the life, on the forehead, on the intelligence having made the decision of those who have chosen to trust and obey. I'm done. So he said, preacher, I have one last message for the world. It's the everlasting gospel. The 14th chapter of the last book of the Bible. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The six seals said the judgment will come to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The everlasting gospel is sent to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The sealing is coming to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And God says, I'm sending you the gospel. I'm sending you the warning. I'm sending you heaven's last call. The angels are holding back destruction. The angels are protecting you from death. Hear me, drifting soul. Hear me, backslider. Hear me, stubborn heart. Hold the wind. Until, until, until I saw a second angel saying Babylon is fallen. Religious confusion will fall. And the third angel followed them saying, if any man worship the beast, 
rejecting the commandments of God and accepting the dictates of an apostate system supported by a lamb-like beast, the same shall receive the wrath of the living God. That's why John in the 6th chapter and the 17th verse asked the troubling question, who shall be able to stand? And the answer comes, I'm going to seal the ones who are settled in their minds. I'm going to seal the ones who've made up their minds. There's a song that says, I'm determined, I have a made up mind. I'm sealing the ones. They may have to lose their job and a man's foes shall be they of his own household or of his own church. But I'm going to seal the ones who've made up their minds. Or oh, sometimes it's a tough choice to make whether to put food on your table or obey the will of the living God. But I'm going to seal my servants. You may have to shed some tears sometimes, but it's only until. You may lose your job maybe, but it's only until. You may lose your life, lose your family, lose your spouse, lose your children, but it's only until. I'm done. I'm done. The seventh chapter is answering two questions. How long? And who shall be able to stand? How long? Not long. You may have to resist unto blood, but hold to God's unchanging hand. How long? Not long. For he that shall come will come. How long? Not long. For the kingdoms of this world shall become God's kingdom. Who shall? Who shall? Who shall be able to stand? He that has surrendered his whole life, who takes up his cross, denying himself and following Jesus, I'm done.